Live to see it, friends, and welcome to the world transformed. This program is your guide to an astounding future that lies ahead, one that will be here sooner than you think, and one that you have an important role to play in bringing about. At The World Transformed, we want to introduce you to what may be the greatest transformation of them all, the one that begins with considering and acting on the almost limitless possibilities that lie before us and that ends somewhere beyond the reach of the human imagination. So, when does this amazing future begin? Well, today is the day. My name is Phil Bowermaster, and with me in the virtual studio is my co-blogger, co-futurist, and co-host, Stephen Gordon. Hello, Stephen. Hey, Phil. How are you? Well, I am super fantastic. How are you, my friend? Man, I'm doing great. This is an amazing Wednesday that uh, you and I have been kind of waiting a long time for, isn't it? This is, uh, this is a particularly amazing Wednesday, so you know, we, buckle up. Last week we had an amazing guest on Amazing Wednesday. This week we're 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 bringing all the amazing ourselves. So I'm feeling uh, feeling feeling pretty excited about that. Actually, we're not because we've got a bunch of help in bringing in bringing this particular amazing. Uh, folks, if you've been waiting for an update on the the long anticipated World Transformed book, this is your show. Okay, because tonight we're going to talk about. What's happening with our book? We've been working on this book for it's been more than three years now, actually, since we uh, uh, since we initially had the idea and uh, and started collecting um, chapters, started collecting submissions to this book from people who have been on the show. So for for those who have joined us subsequently and don't know what we're talking about, maybe you've heard us reference it here or there. Let me let's just back up and say, well, what's this book thing all about? Yeah, we've been we've been working on a book for quite some time, and um, we came up with this idea as kind of an extension of a special series that we used to do. For those who haven't been with us for a long time, this show used to go by a different name. If you listen to our archive shows on Tuesdays and Thursdays, you know that we we used to be Fast Forward Radio, and in fact, um, we still occasionally slip up and refer to ourselves as Fast Forward Radio because it's hard. It's hard not to do something like that for, for years on end and, 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 and <laughs> not have that name slip out once in a while. But we were, we were fast-forward radio most of the time, and then we did these very special kind of mini-series with, with panel discussions of top-name top guests, big-name guests, uh, and we called those series The World Transformed. Um, we did one in, let me see if I got the years right. We did one in 2009, and then we did one in 2011. Is that, does that sound right, Stephen? That sounds right. That yeah. sounds right. So, and they were like these 10-part series. In fact, the second one was so big, it was an 11-part, 10-part series. That's how big the world transformed was. So, so big, we finally took that name on for the show overall. And we said, well, what are we going to do? Are we going to do a 12-part, 10-part series? You know, are we going to do like a 20-part series? No, we had, we had another idea. Let's get... Um, people thinking about their own ideas for transforming the world. And one way to do that would be to share a collection of ideas of, of, around how the world can be transformed. If we, could, if we could put together a big collection of essays um, showing just how diverse the possibilities are for how human ingenuity, how new technologies, how really just new ideas can alter the world – that that would be a great way to get other people thinking about it and a great way to kind of, you know, kick off a process of, of, of people coming up with their own ideas to transform the world. So that, you know, that was, the, that was the, the genesis of the book. We said, well, we'll do a book. We'll do a collection of essays by people, mostly people who've been on the show. We'll do 99 of these. Um, 99, um, what do you call it, Stephen? Just ideas for making the world a better place, I guess, is kind of the... That's right. And... Yeah. I mean, and it's all, and, you know, if, uh, if you've listened to the show and, and you've heard us talk about all these various, you know, topics, you kind of have an idea of some of the topics that are going to be in the book. Uh, uh, this, this, is, uh, this is all futuristic goodness. And, and what, what, makes this, uh, what makes this book interesting is that any one of these topics would w- transform the world, in my opinion. I mean, yes. you, you take any chapter of, you know, and... Uh, and say, okay, let, see this to its fullest extent. You know, the world is a very different place. But <laughs> the thing is, we don't have uh, one chapter like that. It's like you know, you know, it's it's uh, it's ninety nine, right? So, um, or, or ninety nine ideas. It just uh, this it, it the the world is <laughs> completely transformed in ways that are unforeseeable because you know we're we're uh, 
we're uh, shuffling the deck with uh, with these ideas, and uh, who knows what hand uh, will be dealt out of it. But it's uh, uh, it's a fascinating book, and, uh, and, and kind of a way to kind of future proof yourself. If you need to, you know, need to, you, you, I think it's this is basic literacy. It should be uh, to know know these know these ideas, know these topics, to just kind of uh, not be uh, left unaware, you know, when, when these things begin to happen. So, yeah. Well, I, I agree. I think it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of the fundamental skill for being alive in this era. The, the um, personal development author, James Altucher, he actually recommends, um, and I try, I try to do this, he, he recommends write down 10 ideas a day. He, he, he talks about turn yourself into this kind of idea generating machine, and he uses this this notion of ideas combining with other ideas to form new ideas. He calls it idea sex, which is is very similar to what Matt Ridley talks about in the Rational Optimist. You, you know, you take one idea, you, you take another seemingly completely re- unrelated idea, <clears throat> the two get together, they have a baby idea, right? And it's like it. it <laughs> It, it, it mixes the, uh, uh, you know, it mixes the gene code of the two ideas, and you've got a you've got a completely new idea. Um, if if you really want to face the possibilities, if you really want to engage the possibilities that lie ahead, or that really are all around you right now, um, you have to start recognizing them. And the way to recognize them is to articulate them, and to uh, to look at two or three at the same time, and then suddenly have a, a brand new idea, which which combines some aspects of the two, or that flies right in the face of one or two of them. That's, that's the other thing is, if it's possible that we're going to do this, then it's also possible that we're going to do that, right? So um, the, 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 the more you kind of engage this possibility space we live in, I think the, the, the better mastery you have of it and the, the, the better equipped you are to, to deal with the future. So I think, I think it's going to be a very useful book for people right, right along those lines. Um, a, a couple of questions that people might have listening to this, uh, you know, is um, what took so long? Um, and that's a, that is a really fair question. I, I take the brunt of the time frame. The bottom line is we were looking for 99 submissions. And really, in the end, we got about, um, of, the, of the long-form essay submissions, we got about 50 that really work for the book. So we augmented those with some short ones. And my plan was always I would pop in real ones as, as more came in. But, but in the end, we, we, you know, we got 50, about 50 longer ones and we got about 50 shorter ones. And um, we were also holding out. There were certain authors that we were waiting. We were saying, oh, really want to get this person in, really want to have this person's name on the cover. And finally we said, you know what, everyone else has waited long enough. Um, and it's better to get the book out than it is to have – one or two marquee names on it that we were that that, that we were always counting on. So you know, I, I delayed uh, publishing the book for for those kinds of reasons. And um, you know, I looked at it uh, a while back and I said, well, I, I think <laughs> it's time to light this candle, basically, for those who uh, remember the uh, that the line right from the stuff. right stuff. It's <laughs> it's it, it, it's past time people had a chance to uh, to see what's in this book. Now we have changed the title. Um, the working title all along has been The World Transformed, the abridged edition. And, and what we meant by that was, well, here's 99 ideas, but the real book is everybody's idea. And I, and I still like that, um, but I, I think that that title might be a little um, confusing to people. They might see that and go, well, I'll just buy the real one, right? I don't want the abridged one. Give me the, give me the real one. And, and they won't find it, right? So we've changed the name, and I think this is a wonderful name. We're calling it Visions from a World Transformed, or Visions of a World Transformed, I should say. Visions of a World Transformed is the name of the book. It's going to be available via Amazon Kindle. Um, we'll give you an exact date on an upcoming show, but it's going to be very soon. Uh, we're talking within the next couple of weeks, it should be. And it will be, here's the best part, now how much would you pay? Absolutely free. So, you, you, you know, you can't beat that, right? <laughs> and if you don't like it, double your money back. That's right. As with our show, if you don't like it, double your money back. Well, one of the things that, um, one of the plans that we have attached to this is we want to get these ideas into as many hands as possible. That's right. And it seems that giving it away is the friction-free way of getting it into as many hands as possible. Uh, not only because people can just find it on Amazon and, and start reading it, but also because 
if I ask everyone who wrote it or everyone who's listening to tell all your friends, you know, it's pretty easy. You know, it makes a great gift. It's free, right? So give it to somebody. Uh, spread it around. Um, so so I, I'm, I'm very excited about it. We are going to do follow-ups. Uh, we're going to do shows uh, where we interview the folks who have contributed to the book. We'll talk about their ideas, and we'll talk about their new ideas because it has taken a while to get the book out. Um, people are not only going to be talking to us about what they wrote in the book. They probably got either new versions of those ideas or completely new ideas that they, that they want to tell us about. And uh, that, that'll, be, that'll be a great way to kind of keep the momentum going for the book over the next, uh, over the next few months. So it's just, it's very exciting. Um, and also, once it's published, it's going to be just kind of a huge relief for me. Because uh, you know yeah. it's been <laughs> it's been kind of sitting there going, well, we really got to get this thing out. And uh, now, not only will we have it out, I, I feel like Nick Danilov really inspired me last week. You know, with his book, yeah. said, well, hey, if Nick can do it, by golly, we can do it. <laughs> and yeah. and here it comes. So I thought we'd spend a little bit of time this evening, just you know, kind of talking about what's in it. Um, we haven't uh, we haven't had a chance to do that in a while, and by a mo- while I mean at least a couple of years since we've talked about any of the topics. And again, there are 99 ideas, ranging from the profound to the whimsical. Um, we, you know, we, we we've got ideas on there about how to completely change the human condition, and 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 you know, in in, in very fundamental ways. Um, for example, I believe eliminating all human suffering is is one of the ideas presented there. Um, all the way to things like, hey, why don't we make a pack of crayons that has 16 million crayons on it, with, with one color each for each of the uh, uh, each of each of the colors in the RGB spectrum. So that's kind of the range, right? From the uh, from the lighthearted and fun to the very serious. And I thought we would just talk about a few favorite ideas from the book. And uh, Stephen, you wanna do you have one that uh, that you wanna? Yeah, share? yeah. I, you know, I've always loved the idea of the acceleration prizes, Bill. That's early in the book. Uh, what is that, like a third or fourth chapter in? Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, it's uh, maybe it's, uh, you know, not as fundamental as, say, AI, uh, the, um, are, are talking about AI or, or, or uh, age, you know, um, a life extension or something like that. But, uh, um you know, it's it seems that uh, whenever um, you know there's some particular reason that somebody needs something done, offering a prize to get it done it has worked amazingly well over the course of history. I think the first one that we can point to is when Napoleon asked, "How do I, you know, feed my troops?" Right? I mean, what's the best way to uh, get food that's not rotted into the hands uh, hands of my soldiers so I can continue to conquer Europe? Um, of course, the, a prize was held and uh, and canning was uh, uh, won the prize, and um, we've had canning ever since. And, uh, um, you know, talk about something that has uh, been a, a wonderful thing for the world uh, and kept people from starving in, under various circumstances. Canning has been huge, right? So, so wow, uh, somebody invented canning mm-hmm. to win a cash prize. That's to win a, to win the very first push prize. That's right, <laughs> and um, and it was it was a chef in Paris, you know, uh, figured, you know, said well, and, and who had some understanding of germ theory, an early early understanding, and uh, and uh, figured out uh, well, let's let's kill the little bugs and uh, and then seal it so maybe the bugs can't get in, right? Right. And uh, and so canning was invented, and uh, we've had it ever since. Um, then you know, uh, of course, uh, then the prize that Charles Lindbergh won when he flew across the Atlantic Ocean, and of course SpaceX. Now, we, you know, uh, to get commercial uh, space flight uh, kicked off, uh, that was huge. And we get there's a uh, uh, there's a Google is uh, is it Google that's uh, hosting a prize to put a probe on the moon, or is it just participating in it um, to get a I, probe to the moon? Uh, um, uh, I think that's a separate project. Um, but okay. you know, Google has a director of moon shots, so it's a little confusing, right? They, you know, they, 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 <laughs> they call a lot of the, the big stuff they do, uh, moon shots, but, uh, yeah, I think Google is one of the participants in that over, over okay. project. And so, yeah, there's all these different push prizes now. I mean, it was, uh, uh, self-driving cars. Um, you know, we're, we we are where we are today because in part because of the DARPA prize, right? So, um, you know, the, uh, so many of these different areas that can transform the world 
uh, owe their start to uh, what I think maybe it was my term. I, I, it'd be neat if, it, if I invented the term push prize, but uh, acceleration prize might be a better term. I don't know, but it's uh, um, you know, so many areas owe their uh, beginnings to it, and uh, I, I think that uh, there's possibilities for new uh, acceleration prizes in the future. So, yeah, well, I, I think I the, like the, that. I, I particularly like that chapter. That 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 section of the book actually talks about. Um, it, it, it's talking about acceleration prizes as a kind of subcategory within within push prizes. The idea of being uh, you don't you don't necessarily have to come up with a new idea. But let's award a prize for someone who accelerates um, a process, right? Just for speeding yeah. things up, just just for just for taking something and moving it along. Which um, you might think of them as optimization prizes or, or or something along those lines too, rather than um, uh, rather than just um, having the prize for coming up with an idea. This is the prize for accelerating an idea, and I and, and I think that. Uh, uh, I think something like that would work. I think something like that would would help, um, you know, if you targeted the right areas, uh, help move certain things along. There are things, we, you know, we talked about on Monday getting to AGI. I don't know that we would need a, an acceleration prize for that, but there have been technologies that we've waited a long time for in the past, like uh, nuclear fusion, right? Um, it, what if instead of saying, well, we're going to give you a, you know, a billion dollars if you make a fusion reaction, we say, we're going to give you a billion dollars if you just, you know, if you cut the time between now and when it's commercially deployed to, um, you know, two years or something like that, right? Give, give, us the, give us the plan that's actually going to take the time out of the process. Yeah, I think that, uh, I, think, I think that's a good one. I've got a, I've got a fun one here by Bell Black, um, which doesn't sound fun at all. Uh, the, 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 name of, the name of her chapter is Embrace pain. And um, I, I think this is a fun one. I like the counterintuitive ones. I got another counterintuitive one coming up on my list. But um, uh, th- this one, you know, flies in the face of one I mentioned earlier, which is one of the ideas in the book is let's eliminate all human suffering. And now here Bell is, she's saying, no, let's increase suffering. And it's very interesting because she talks about how technology has, and really all human progress has enabled us to work, you know, kind of work the suffering out of the system. And she talks about um, how, you know, progress is just, what's the word I'm looking for? It is, it is inspired by, it is launched by pain. So, you know, she talks about, the, you know, she, she gives ideas for us maybe not allowing ourselves to adapt to pain or not allowing ourselves to avoid pain, but rather... Uh, new new ways to take it and move ourselves forward. It's actually almost kind of like the acceleration idea, right? Um, where we have an idea and it's sitting there for a long time and nothing happens with it. Um, like this book, right? It sat there for a long time and now it's it, <laughs> you know, right now here it is coming out. Well, the same thing kind of happens with um, we get used to things being bad and and it it doesn't change, especially because you know we kind of anesthetize ourselves to the suffering. Bell gives an idea, uh, actually a set of ideas for how we can turn that on its head, how we can, um, you know, take the fact that we've got a happiness deficit there and make it into a plus, right? Turn that into something, well, we're going to fill that gap rather than making ourselves feel better. We're going to solve the problem and we're going to, you know, we're going we're to move ourselves ahead. It's a, it's a, it's a great chapter. And I, one of the things I really like about it is that it, um, it speaks to an overall strategy, kind of like the one you just mentioned, an overall strategy for how we get to the future. And I think, uh, I, I, I think there's an endless number of those, but there are a few really good ones and a few that kind of point out the, the big deficits that we currently have, and, and that's a good one for that. Oh, gosh, well, we're going to run out of time, Stephen, before we run out of these. Let's yeah, we will. I, I'm do just some more. thinking, uh, you know, it, nothing uh, uh, puts a fire under us like, uh, you know, being pained about, you know, some – Thing in our lives, right? If you, if there's something that's really bothering us, we put our devote our energies towards it, and perhaps uh, I think maybe she's onto something there. I like that. Um, um, John Smart's uh, 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 his his chapter on brain preservation, Bill, is a favorite of mine. It's uh, um, you know we we it's an area that we've talked about uh, a number of times but not much lately um uh, seems like we have not talked about cryopreservation all that much um uh, it's not something that i uh you know i aspire to uh it's it, you know it's sort of a last it's a 
it's a last ditch thing you do uh, because everything else has not worked out, right? Yeah. Um, and <laughs> but it's uh, um, it's it's re- you know a re- remarkably interesting uh, chapter about the state of the art and how that's moving forward. It's it's uh, it's much different than just throwing a body in the deep freeze, uh, like perhaps it was, you know, <laughs> back in the '60s or something. Uh, well, it'll be something. it'll be fun yeah. to have John on because it's been too long since we've spoken to him anyway. But it'll be fun to have yeah. him on. And this organization that he references in his chapter um, it has made progress in the time since the the book has been published. So he can give us an update on where are we in terms of preserving preserving brains. And one of the interesting things about John's take on brain preservation is he's not looking at it primarily as a life extension technique. He's looking at it mainly as a way of making sure we save all that great information that's in people's brains. Yeah, it's a, yeah I mean, e- even if we are unable to uh, bring that person back, I mean, uh, whenever a person dies, a library burns, right? I mean, that's yeah, exactly. uh, a, a amazing uh, amount of information is lost. And uh, so, yeah, if, uh, if, even if you can't bring the person back, you've, you've saved so much if, uh, if you can save their... Uh, you know, <laughs> their memories. So that's that's pretty great. That, that is a that is a fun topic, and it does kind of go to the breadth of um, of ideas. Speaking of which, there's an essay in here by Dave Gobel called "If We Build It, They Will Come," and what Dave is talking about is building amusement parks on the moon because that'll be the best way to colonize the moon. And if that sounds like a silly idea, um, you got to read the essay. I'm telling you, this is a brilliant idea. Because uh, you know what you can do on the moon that you can't do on Earth, Stephen? Well, you can you can jump a long way. <laughs> yeah, you or fly. as you could as fly. Dave you says it, we can it. literally fly with wings, yeah. like a bird, as God intended we should fly. And uh, <laughs> you know, uh, on on Earth, you you know you can do hang gliders, and and you know there are very sophisticated bicycle type things that'll flap wings, and you can slowly do this lofty thing. No, man, on the moon you can you can put on a couple of nice form fitting ergonomic wings, start flapping your arms, and fly. Okay, it 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 it, it really could work at that one sixth gravity. And he he paints a wonderful, charming, delightful picture of what life would be like on the moon where people have taken up flying as, you know, kind of like they do skiing here on Earth. Um, it becomes a big tourist attraction for the moon, and it becomes a, one of the ways that, uh, that you, you know, that you create industry on the moon and that, that you attract people to it. When we talk about people going to the moon, we always think helium-3, right? There's the wonderful energy source uh, sitting on the moon. And we always think, well first step into space. And there's all these serious, um, I don't know, mainstream businessy slash government style slash future history style reasons for going to the moon. This is one of the best reasons I've ever seen for going to the moon um, b- because of the fun we can have on the moon that we can't have on Earth. And uh, anyway, uh, you, you can't read that essay without, without a smile on your face. If, uh, well, I mean, and you could and, and have fun with that, and uh, at the same time know that uh, you could get serious work done too, uh, in, in you know, in preparation of going further out into the solar system, because you know, a one six gravity well, uh, that to me, and and this and that close to Earth too, uh, that that is the spot we can, you know, we we launch to the rest of the solar system from. It would seem, it would seem that that would be the. That would be uh, the the moon uh, is a uh, is the beginning, I think. So, um, to everyone looking to Mars right now, I, I, I think perhaps we get back to the moon too uh, in the process, and, and from there we that's our launching pad. And and you know, per, per Dave Goble, we got to think of all the fun reasons to go to Mars. That's oh yeah, gonna... absolutely. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's well, going to um, be what draws us there. Okay. Uh, let me point to one of the little uh, little paragraph ones. Uh, the the um, that uh, as as a favorite vending machines that sell everything, Phil. Mm. Um, you know, I I, I published my uh, you know coffee shopification. You know, in the future everything will be a coffee shop um, uh, article a while back. And uh, you know, I think vending machines are part of uh, is an enabling technology that could get us there. If you have a uh, you know, what's the point of uh, you know going to uh, you know fifteen twenty acre Walmart's you know uh, when uh, you can just pop in uh, to a convenience store that has a vending machine that can sell you anything uh, because it can it can print anything right or right. quickly uh, package up something very quickly for you. Um, 
that's uh, you know I, I think that's uh, it's it's a uh, you know you can you can do this before you get a molecular assembler you can do it by 3D printing and uh, and you know uh, and I've, I've thought about bookstores that are nothing but a single uh, machine that that uh, prints on demand the book whatever book whether it's in print or out uh, you know you just it, it's really just a coffee shop with a with a book printing service right right there next to it right yeah so, I mean we've uh, talked about these kind of universal book printing systems we've talked about universal assemblers I like the image here of it's a vending machine right it's yeah just the, it's a vending machine it's not it's not anything big I mean we've we've had vending machines forever yeah. and so it's it's something that could be quickly and easily dropped into our lives and uh, we've uh, you know, um, Blockbuster uh, was killed by Redbox. Why not, right? So uh, <laughs> this this would be the the machine that kills everything, right? It, yeah, that's it's, right. Uh, it's basic. Basically, it's like, what do you need? Chocolate bar? Okay, chocolate bar. Oh, you need new uh, you need new ink cartridge for your printer? Oh, okay, you need a new smartphone? Yeah, there. Whatever. You need new pair of pants? Boom. Yeah, just whatever it is. <laughs> Right. You got, <laughs> this thing, you got it. This thing, this thing will uh, will pop one out for you. Um, and at that point, I don't. You won't even have to swipe your card, right? It'll just be like it'll read your retina or something like that. And your, <laughs> That's right. A, account will be charged. Okay. Well, I got one more. We're going to go a little long tonight because um, um, I'll talk. I'll talk in a few minutes about what's happening on Friday. But we're not going to do other geek on Friday. We're going to do that tonight. But I got to. But I got to do one more uh, topic from the book, and we'll we'll wrap up the the, the book first. Um, one of my favorite chapters, I have to say, of this book is written by you, Stephen. And again, it's one of those uh, counterintuitive uh, pieces. This this one is all about um, uh, self-driving cars. And the title you gave it was Save Lives by Adopting Imperfect Self-Driving Cars. Originally, we had talked about it. Uh, I, I think the original title that we had discussed for this was something along the lines of self-driving cars will ki- kill 10,000 people. Therefore, we should uh, a year. Therefore, we should adopt them as quickly as possible. Um, it's the uh, it's the kind of counterintuitive. Um, here's, a, here's a technology that's not perfect. Here's a technology that doesn't solve all problems. And yet we should move to it as quickly as possible. And since it's your chapter, Stephen, and you get to be the first author interviewed on the show since uh, since we've announced the publication of the book, um, what's the rationale there? Well, we can't let the perfect be the enemy of the of the better, right? Or the good. Um, right. If we wait to have a perfect self-driving car, we'll never have a self-driving car. It, and and what we what we want is a self-driving car that gets us there safer and better than than the average human driver. If uh, so, if uh, if in adopting um, self-driving cars, uh, you know, and these self-driving cars make mistakes and actually kill people. I mean, you know, you you can point to individuals that would be living today were it not for self-driving cars. It, that's when it gets tough, right? I mean, but that's also the point at which you say, but you know what? Look at the numbers for the entire year. We, you know, yeah, self We've 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 moved completely to self-driving cars. Uh, we did it one year, right? No, no, it won't happen like that. But let's just imagine it did. Right. And uh, we moved completely to a hundred uh, to self-driving cars, and self-driving cars killed ten thousand people this year. Well, it sure beats the thirty thousand people that were killed last year when we were all driving our own cars. Right. Um, and so that's um, and 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 that's my point is that uh, we can we will not get perfect self-driving cars and we'll do it anyway because it will be better. Yeah, the uh, reason and, to be excited about a technology that kills ten thousand people a year is it's replacing one that kills thirty thousand a year. That's the bottom line. Right. Like, that's the bottom line. The reason to be yeah. excited is the twenty thousand people who don't die every year. <laughs> I mean, and yeah. that's that's an amazing thing to be excited about. We we're, were talking about a lot of people, a, a lot of lives saved and also a lot of injuries avoided, a lot of lives not ruined, right? Um, right. Just a huge improvement in quality of life. And Stephen, it's a great essay. You make a, you, you make a really good point there in the book. And I urge everyone, as soon as it's available, to get the book. And if you don't jump right to that chapter, just make sure you keep reading till you get there. We kind of buried Stephen in the book, I got to tell you. So <laughs> that's okay. I'm 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 in good company all around. We, we we knew so. people would want to read that one, so we thought, well, we'll get some of those other ones up there, so people read that too. You know, kind of <laughs> just just keep reading until you get to Stephen, and then keep reading after Stephen too. That's my that's my advice on the book. So so that's a you know a small sampling of the ideas, and and I wish I could say it was representative, but the other ideas that are in there are so different from those that it's it's hard to give a representative sample. Uh, I, I recommend 
you read the book. And also, I recommend you listen to this show because if you like those kinds of ideas, you know what? We're just gonna we're gonna we're gonna keep popping them out. And as I said, we're gonna keep bringing the authors back uh, to to talk about more ideas. Um, we still want to give away 10,000 copies of this book. I think it's not going to be that hard to do once it's uh, once it's up and running. But um, I've been saying for a couple of years now. Stay tuned for for big news about the book. Well, this is the big news. Uh, it's going to be out soon. We're going to give you a date soon. It'll be on Amazon. And uh, look for the book. And now, Stephen, because we are uh, uh, resuming our discussions with some of the authors, we're going to have Brian Wong on Friday to talk uh, not so much about his idea in the book as a brand new idea that he has and to give Brian uh, all the time he needs to, uh, to explain this really exciting idea that he has. I thought we'd just, let's do a little other geek on Wednesday. Let's make it the most amazing Wednesday ever by adding some other geek <laughs> to, our, uh, to, to our discussion of the book. What do you got for us, other geek this wise, this week? Well, let me just ask you, Phil, I mean, with, with uh, publishing book and the day job and, and, and small kids and everything, if you're like me at all, uh, finding time to sit down and, and, uh, and, and read is sort of, you know, I, I've gotten to where I'd, I, I've, uh, I'd, I'd love to read, you know, sit down and read a long book like, like this one, but also uh, uh, find that I can, I can consume a lot of books uh, by way of audio. And uh, I've, I've kind of really gotten into Audible as a source of, uh, of getting some, you know, some uh, getting some reading in, quote unquote, right? Uh, yep. And, and I've experienced a couple of, uh, of books here recently that I would uh, I would highly, highly, highly recommend. Uh, the first is Ready Player One. And uh, Phil, have you read that book? Seems like we mentioned it a couple of times. Uh, and uh, it's not ringing a bell at all. No, what is that? Okay. Um, and maybe it was a guest of ours that brought it up. But Ready Player One is a fantastic book. I mean, just, I mean, it grabs you at the beginning, and uh, you're, you're, you're with it until the end. It's a, a dystopian. This is a future. novel, uh, right? This is this fiction is we're talking about? Yeah. This is fiction. Uh, this is a dystopian future where, um, you know, uh, in, you know, sort of the maker's future almost, okay? People are... Uh, are, are living in a world that's sort of winding down, but in, there's all these different technologies too that are not available now. Um, and um, and and so this this guy that's uh, uh, you know has uh, been a developer like a Steve Jobs type or, or something, uh, or or maybe a um, you know a game developer of, of sorts. He, uh, he he has invented a a, a three dimensional second reality kind of. Uh, uh, a place where people spend a lot of their time is called the Oasis, kind of like Second uh, Life you, kind of idea, yeah, right? Yeah. Exactly, yeah. and uh, and so you can you can spend your time in Oasis uh, doing you know working, playing, whatever, and uh, and and a lot of people spend their lives that way because the outside world's not so not so much fun. And so uh, and when he dies, he says, you know what? Uh, I don't I don't have any heirs. Uh, anybody who can solve this puzzle that I put into my game. Uh, is uh, you know will will uh, win my fortune, and um, and so the and the game is afoot, and it takes years to solve. Okay, but I mean there there are people, and and it's an um, you know it's an Easter egg hunt, you know in a way because there's Easter eggs in this game, an oasis, right? And they, and these um, and and egg hunters uh, becomes contracted to gunters, and so the, all these gunters are searching for these eggs and. Uh, and of course, uh, you know this guy is a child of the '80s, and so I mean, just overnight, the whole world becomes obsessed with uh, '80s pop culture. And uh, I mean, just uh, '80s pop culture references are just throughout the the book, which you know speaks to me, you know, because that's that's the age uh, I'm the right age to appreciate that. Loved this book. I mean, absolutely, it's so much fun. Um, I, I can't recommend it highly enough. Um, and uh, look, you know, I look forward to you reading it so that uh, we can talk about it sometime. Okay, well, I'm on Audible too. I, I I can get a book a month, so I'll I'll, I'll put that in the queue. Um, after I'm after I'm done what I'm currently listening to, I'll uh, I'll see if I can't get that give that one a listen. That sounds like a sounds like a fun potential show topic. It's we had to you know maybe oh, think yeah. about having the author on talk about this a little bit. That would be uh, that, that was a that was a fun fun book. Um, the other one that I enjoyed almost as much. Um, it was uh, it's called We Are Legion, We Are Bob. <laughs> it's a it's a uh, it's a funny title, uh, but um, it's you know uh, cryopreservation is part of it. Uh, 
von Neumann probes is a big part of uh, this this uh, story and uh, fascinating. I mean, a fully realized. I mean, with you think with that silly title, it would be like uh, very much tongue in cheek. No, this is this is hard sci-fi and fascinating. Just absolutely great. I, I highly recommend uh, We Are Legion, We Are Bob. Fantastic. Uh, okay, cool. So, so two yeah. two good books, both available via Audible. If you don't have time yeah. to read and you want to listen to some uh, uh, yeah. some some good compelling fiction, um, <laughs> save you your reading time for our these. book and uh, go listen to these books when you get a moment in the car. Right. That's right. <laughs> Just you know, all things books tonight. Well, let me add another geek. Um, I mentioned on Monday show. I mentioned uh, the Lego Batman movie. Yeah. Uh, everybody needs to go see the Lego Batman movie. Uh, this is a. I, I want. I want all the executives at DC to understand why the Lego Batman movie is great, um, and how much they could learn from their regular DC expanded universe about how to make a fun, lighthearted, and yet really good movie um, uh, about you know characters who've existed for a long time. There, there, there seems to be this idea that if you're going to if you're going to expand on characters that were developed in the comics, the, the only direction you can go is dark, right? That you, have to, that you have to take that existing material and make it serious and gritty and realistic. And, and, and I think, if anything, DC has gone way overboard on that stuff. Um, Lego Batman movie shows you a completely different direction it can go, and it is a fun, fun movie. I, I can't remember laughing that hard at a movie in, I, I don't know, it's been a long time. Uh, a lot of a lot of great self-referential stuff, references to the other Batman movies. You know, it's a real loving tribute to Batman and just to geek culture generally. And um, I, I can't recommend it highly enough. B- best superhero movie I can remember seeing in quite some time. Um, kind of kind of makes me interested in superhero movies again, to tell you the truth. Um, I plus, also, uh, you know what? Great Lego movie. For, <laughs> if, if, if that's if that's a thing. You know, well, it is a thing genre. Now. This is this is the second one, right? This is the second Lego movie, and uh, they um, yeah, buy stock in Lego, right? Well, yeah, they, these guys because um, uh, Lego is just you know just bricks, right? But uh, they have uh, th- their ability to uh, you know to buy in, uh, intellectual licenses and use that, and then make video games out of it, and now movies. Uh, uh, the, the, the brilliantly run company. Lego. So, yeah. I, 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 all I can tell you is it just goes to show you how unpredictable the future. A few years ago, it's not that long ago, if you had told me that there was going to be something called the Lego Batman movie, I wouldn't even have understood how those words go together, right? I mean, I wouldn't, <laughs> right? I would have been, well, what do you mean? What exactly do you mean by that? But I wouldn't have believed that that would be a good idea to make something called the Lego Batman movie, much less that I would think of it as like one of the best movies I've seen in a long time. You know, I, it's just. Uh, <laughs> It, 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 it's really, really quite wonderful. My, uh, great for the whole family, obviously. My kids loved it, and uh, I loved it too. So get a chance, Stephen, when, uh, when, when you get the opportunity. I want you to go see Lego Batman. I think, I think you're really going to love it. Soon as, as soon as uh, we're up for it, uh, as, a, as an entire family, I'm, I'm taking them. Uh, before we talk again, I'm sure I will. This, and this is not a spoiler, but listen for this line. Uh, maybe my biggest laugh. Um, ask your nerd friends. Okay, just wait for wait for that line. <laughs> okay. If you don't, if right. you don't <laughs> laugh out loud when you hear that line, then I'll, uh, I'll I don't know you as well you as you. When, uh, when I hear that line, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll tip my hand. No <laughs> doubt. All right, well, hey, this has been fun, Stephen. Hey, you know, it was a lot of fun writing the book with you uh, and with uh, all, of our, uh, all of our authors of the book. Looking forward to announcing when that is available on Amazon in the very near future. Uh, looking forward to Friday's show. As I said, we're going to be talking with Brian Wong about uh, – at fascinating new idea that he's come up with. You don't want to miss that. Thank you all for being with us. And until next time, live to see it. <laughs>